Ajit Tripathi, head of institutional business at Aave, a London-based technology company focused on creating a transparent and open infrastructure for decentralized finance. Hi, uh, this is, uh, it's been a while since I did a, a conference on, uh, on anything except Zoom, so this is quite a nice experience. Uh, thank you for inviting us to present uh, and talk at this uh, at this event. It seems to have been really put together very well, for which I should congratulate the organizers for putting up a great show. Now, uh, so my role, you know, just to give a bit of background about myself, uh, I've been in the whole blockchain and crypto space since uh, 2015, January. Uh, so I used to build, uh, I built the P PwC's blockchain business back in 2015 when it was very early days. And uh, that was the time when institutions didn't really want to talk about Bitcoin, uh, right? So if you ended up in a meeting with a bank and you said, hey, you guys should look into Bitcoin, then they, you, they, they would look at, what the hell are you talking about? And everyone wanted to talk about DLT, which is kind of private enterprise blockchains and so on and so forth. So, so that was 2015. Then uh, at that time, we did a, a really interesting project on Ethereum with the Bank of England, which is a UK central bank. And they were quite prompt, you know, interested in the technology, uh, but, but more from a central bank digital currency point of view. Then, um, then I went to consensus and built out the fintech, you know, played a major role in building out the fintech business and the London office for consensus. Uh, after that, in, uh, you know, then the bear market hit us really badly. And uh, Ethereum was, it wasn't quite clear where Ethereum was going to go, but I think the developer interest was only growing. The 2018, 2019, uh, you know, is when institutions started to look at it and everyone was talking about institutional wall of money, institutional wall of money, the wall of money is coming and every day on Twitter, everyone was sort of talking about it. But not, not a lot was happening except, you know, builders were building infrastructure in the back end. There were lots of uh, companies building crypto custody. Uh, there were <clears throat> some early days with Coinbase Pro and Kraken Pro and other folks starting to build institutional venues. Then, then the DeFi movement, you know, the folks like Stani, uh, Jordan, they were, they've been in the space for four years in the DeFi space. They were building uh, a great product uh, and, and other builders as well, right? Uniswap, Synthetix, and so on. Quite a few interesting engineers building really, really great and interesting product. But there wasn't a lot of attention on DeFi and a lot of us, you know, who went to DevCon were very early. And uh, then comes, then the whole world shifted to digital. Uh, in 2020, you know, everyone became locked in their houses and uh, th then we started using Zoom a lot more. Everyone became comfortable with the remote access, the interest in everything digital uh, just went up, right? So fintech, fintechs did really well in 2020 after the March crash, it suddenly picked up. Then, uh, so, you know, Aave was uh, relaunched around Jan as, as a sort of a pooled uh, lending protocol, uh, or what we now call a liquidity protocol, because the users are much broader than lending. And uh, somewhere around and uh, and around March, the whole interest in DeFi started to pick up tremendously. And you know, DeFi now has gone from 600 million to to what almost 40, 50 billion in TVL on any given day. Uh, you know, easily similar 40 billion odd in market cap for tokens. So, the, uh, so I, I think the question is, you know, where do we go from here? And uh, obviously, there has been some discussion about regulation today. Uh, now, what I do for Aave is uh, is institutional, uh, you know, De DeFi. So it's still early in my space. Uh, but what does that institutional really mean, right? Because uh, if you look at Bitcoin, um, so Bitcoin was the first digital asset we all know. Bitcoin is basically a bearer asset. You know, there are uh, there have been some enhancements to it, but you can't really do a lot with Bitcoin, right? I mean, it's 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 basically an asset. You can hold, you can pay with it. That's great. Now, then comes along Ethereum as a developer platform. Uh, sure, you can build some interesting applications on that. That's great. Then comes along, uh, you know, then come along things like Flow Protocol and so on, where you kind of build NFTs and and some other applications that are not necessarily for crypto native people they even anyone any artist musician whoever can build use some of those applications on either ethereum flow or whatever it is right so that's the next generation then DeFi, and that's the time when we're doing crypto kitties you know asteroid mining and whatnot 
uh, and a lot of moonshot projects were going on at the time, like token curated registries and whatnot. So, so I've seen kind of three or four bull and bear markets now. And in crypto, you never know on any given day where you are. So now institutional has a few things, right? So institutional is about, uh, so what characterizes retail from institutional? The first thing is a lot of lawyers, right? So so as soon as you get into institutional, uh, so you, you're dealing with two things. Either institutions have their own money, which we call proprietary, or it's client money, you know, other people's money. Uh, so things like uh, asset managers manage, managing other people's money, family offices managing some, you know, or private wealth institutions managing rich people's money. And at the far end, you have retail which is the likes of Revolut, Monzo, whoever. And th these are you know, typically uh, customers that require a lot of protections, right? So because uh, what you, on one hand, it's great that everyone can now invest on Robinhood and you know, uh, trade freely. There is all this democratization of risk taking. Anyone can do whatever they want. But at the same time, that looks great in a bull market. That doesn't look so great in a bear market. So what happens is you know, retail customers love to, to trade and speculate in when things are going up. And they want to be let alone to do everything they want to do. But when the markets start to crash, then it's the same investors that then you know are complaining to regulators. And, and I, I spent six months at Binance doing some fiat on-ramp work. And one thing I learned is that retail customers tend to be very you know bullish on the on the upside and and then they tend to, to, to ask for a lot of legal and regulatory protection on the downside. So so institutional, across uh, you know uh, when it comes to managing other people's money and when we take institutional in that sense you know asset managers hedge funds so on uh, then then there are requirements right and those legal and regulatory requirements are designed to protect investors so uh, on the upside great on the downside we need protect we all want to, to we all want regulation right uh, i mean so that creates some interesting challenges now, since 1933, when the U.S. Uh, installed the Securities and Exchange Act, there has been a lot of regulation, right? And especially since the financial crisis in 2008, there has been more regulation created than in the previous 100 years before that. So, so I used to work in compliance and regulatory change for PwC part-time in, in, in addition to my blockchain job. And it was all about rules, 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 and new rules created to fix the old rules that weren't working. So all of those rules have a good intention, right? They're designed to protect investors from things like scams, from losing money, from being taken for a ride by unscrupulous actors, and you know, and so on and so forth. So a lot of rules have good intent. And, and, and especially when things are not going well in markets, then all of those rules come in very handy for a lot of small investors who can't, who don't always know what they're buying, right? So right now, everyone is chasing the same, every, every crypto uh, currency is going up, it's great, but when it's not going up, then, then investors want protection. So, uh, and we saw that with GameStop and whatnot, right? And now, so institutional is basically, you take the current technology and product that's great, now you start to think about regulation and what are those regulatory areas? There is obviously KYC, you know, which is who is actually investing, who is actually doing things. There is AML, which is, you know, things like transaction monitoring. Is there like criminal money getting into this? Uh, and, and yeah, sure. And since it, there is a whole aspect of censorship resistant, resistance where you want to you know, make sure that uh, people who are protesting regimes like Venezuela, you know, or, or are suffering in failed economies, are not restricted by oppressive governments uh, from participating in Bitcoin or public blockchain applications. So that's very, very important. But it's very hard to draw a line between that and, you know, so let's say criminal money and or not necessarily, you know, uh, sort of money from good actors in the ecosystem. So, so regulators have a hard job on their hands. So do innovators, right? So innovators, if, if, if all of the innovation today has to follow all the rules that have been built since in the last 400 years, then there will be no innovation. Whereas if no rules are followed, then also there will be no innovation. And if Coinbase, you know, Coinbase wouldn't have scaled if they hadn't got a good compliance program. Coinbase wouldn't have scaled if they hadn't got a, you know, sort of the right UX, uh, customer service, asset protection, so on and so forth. So, so to scale beyond where DeFi is today, uh, right, and and to go from let's say forty billion to one trillion in TVL and assets, there is going to be more regulation. I mean, that's that's not something that I think anyone should try to avoid. So what I do on my uh, in my day, day day job is sort of you know th three or four things. One is 
uh, we do a, I do a lot of work or we do a lot of work on you know working with institutions to understand their requirements and needs uh, right so what we are committed to is public permissionless blockchain applications I did, you know this whole DLT uh, deploying a blockchain inside somebody's firewalls that's not a thing right I, I, that, that then blockchain doesn't necessarily add a lot of value so it has to be public permissionless Less blockchain. It has to be smart contracts on the public blockchain. It has to be decentralized, as, as in it should not be controlled by a bank or a, or you know one or two rich people uh, or some guy who runs a large exchange or something. It should be governed by a broad community of lots of token holders that have you know some stake in the well-being of the protocol. Uh, and no one particular party has, should have a lot of you know say because then it's not decentralized, right? If one one guy can vote in whatever proposals then it's not decentralized. So, so institutions actually like decentralization from a customer asset protection perspective. And when, it, when we think of decentralization in those terms, I haven't had anyone in our sort of partner base or anyone say, look, this is not a good idea or decentralization is not a good idea. So decentralization is actually a good thing from a regulatory perspective. Now, uh, the, the challenges that are created because of that uh, are, you know, who is, who is liable? So, so, so a, DAO, a DAO is not necessarily a legal person. Uh, if something goes wrong, then you cannot take a DAO to court. Uh, or, you know, all the DAO, will the, all the DAO members who are voting on a DAO, will they accept liability and will they want to be represented in court? Uh, so, so I think some of those legal questions are, you know, things that regulators are thinking very closely about and institutional market participants are also informing that. Then custodians have a central role in asset protection. You know, right now, the uh, every, DeFi is by definition self-custodial. Right. So, but at the same time, self custodial doesn't work for everyone. Right. So, self custodial is great for me. I know what to do with my private keys. I know what to do with my wallets. I know what to do with my 24 words. Now, for a lot of, you know, let's say customers who are not as tech savvy or are not necessarily engineers, it takes a lot of training and education and, and informing. And then, you know, they would rather not lose their Bitcoin, right? They would not rather not lose their tokens. Uh, so, so when you when you ask them to prioritize, then a lot of retail customers want. So, retail customers who come in through institutions want asset protection more than self custody. So, so DeFi being financial infrastructure needs to serve all all individuals, right? So, if some people prefer to custody their own assets, like me, great. If some people want to go through Revolut or wallets or so on, then they should have that option. So ultimately, everyone should have choice, and DeFi is about consumer choice. So, 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 what's happening today is that you know today there was an announcement about a, a Nash wallet uh, integrating with Aave. So you know Aave is a decentralized protocol, which means anyone can build. The source code is online. The liquidity is on the public internet. Uh, so Nash created a wallet which essentially allows. You know, they do the KYC, they onboard uh, retail customers, but they can use Aave as an infrastructure in the background. And Aave sort of becomes this pool of liquidity, which allow, you know, which provides sort of high interest rates uh, to to, customer, to uh, Nash's customers in an environment where, you know, the, 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 the yields are very, very low or almost zero interest rates. So, so it's an opportunity for customers. And then the role of the protocol is to be like Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin is infrastructure. Ethereum is infrastructure. Similarly, DeFi is also infrastructure. It's just an evolution of the same digital asset world. So that's kind of how we see it now. On the on the more hedge fund, uh, large, you know, the Goldman Sachs side of the world. Uh, so custodians have a critical role because uh, you know custodians do uh, take take responsibility for a lot of compliance and asset protection. So they do the KYC, they do transaction monitoring, they sign legal contracts with, with sort of customers saying they will protect those assets, right? And, and sort of make sure they have the right controls in place and so on and so forth. So custodians become the gatekeepers. Uh, and of course, in, in the original vision of Bitcoin, we don't want a lot of gatekeepers, right? But again, is that more important or is consumer choice more important? So at the end of the day, consumers should have the choice. If they want to use an app, they want to use MetaMask directly, they want to use a hardware wallet, or they want to use a custodian. So it's not up to us as infrastructure builders, it's up to the customers and that's great, right? Consumers and users. So they get to decide how they want to interact with the protocol. Now, uh, and it's the same as Bitcoin, right? Some, some people prefer to use Bitcoin through a custodian and that's perfect. So, so DeFi now, on the, the other thing is insurance, right? So DeFi has had a little bit of headline risk. We obsess with security. We spend more time and money on security than on almost anything else. Uh, and that's because, you know, it's kind of our responsibility as the DeFi community to make sure that we treat assets with the responsibility that uh, comes with those, you know, people trusting us with their assets. 
Uh, and, and that's the only way DeFi will scale. If we don't take that responsibility seriously as developers and engineers, then, you know, I mean, people won't trust in, in the tech and as much as they should be doing. Uh, so that's the so, so security. We have done five audits. We have done formal verification. We our community spends a lot of time on providing feedback on you know various risk parameters and so on. And that's something you know institutions value. Uh, so uh, so so now this is this is a very cool phenomenon where the interests of you know individual customers and institutional customers start to align, and that hasn't been the case in banking for a long time. So you know what happens today in banking is that you know uh, managers and shareholders win and everybody else pays right so banks take a lot of risk and then there is a big financial crisis or banks decide to charge customers for things that they didn't tell them about there's no transparency so what DeFi is doing is sort of you know solving that stakeholder problem because now uh, if you are a stakeholder in DeFi, then you have an incentive to work uh, uh, to sort of look after the protocol make sure you know what you're getting into and I mean, in, initially it was all apes and degens, but now with a lot of you know, uh, uh, sort of lawyers, regulators, uh, institutions, sort of ordinary uh, non-technical people coming into the space, that sort of stakeholder alignment is starting to happen more and more. Now, historically, and 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 what does this do, right? So first of all, DeFi is open source. All the tech is on chain. The code is on GitHub. Uh, risk parameters are online, documentation is online. If you don't trust the documentation, you can go read the code. Uh, if you have a proposal on Aave, you can make that proposal, right? So if, if you want uh, the protocol to change in some way, you can get uh, voting power from someone else. You don't need to buy a lot of tokens. So we take this decentralization responsibility very, very seriously because you know that's kind of how the incentives get aligned. And incentive alignment solves the stakeholder problem, right? So right now, banks have an incentive to do whatever they want to do behind the firewall or behind their walls with five guys sitting in a closed room making decisions. That's not how DeFi works. In DeFi, if you have you know a bad code, it'll get hacked. If you have you know if you haven't done proper testing and you're testing in fraud, you know bad things will happen. So whereas you know if if it's if a protocol is completely centralized and someone owns eighty percent of the token, you can't hide that, right? I mean, people will know about it because it's all on chain. So so what that does is uh, you know everyone who is participating in a DeFi protocol like Aave has an incentive to secure the protocol, has an incentive to you know come up with ideas that uh, that 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 sort of help uh, the protocols evolve and scale and create new applications on top of that. So that that's a fundamentally new way of architecting architecting financial services, and and when we talk to regulators, uh, you know, and policymakers about this idea that look, instead of creating more and more rules and paper and paper and paper that people can hide behind and you know align with the 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 language of the law, but not necessarily the spirit of the spirit of the law, why don't we create this you know the DeFi as sort of the transparent infrastructure of, that anyone can look at that is completely not hidden. It's in it's in front of everyone. It's transparent. The logic is there. If there is anything dodgy with it, you kind of know about it, right? So so it's the, so that transparency is how stakeholder incentives are aligned. Because you know if you're a if you're a user, and it, you know you can see what's going on. If you're a developer, you can see what's going on. If you're an investor, you know exactly what's going on because you have a lot to you know uh, lot at stake. So so this sort of uh, uh, what what I've seen as coming in from traditional financial services. And getting into DeFi is that you know this transparency of logic has created a lot of stakeholder alignment, which hasn't been the case, and that's kind of in my mind, you know, across individuals, institutions, regulators, and everyone else, we are starting to see that, and that's something we look to drive in the future as well. That's pretty much it for me.